definitions is why it's necessary to crush and reduce the size of material, how fine and analyze particle sizes, the different mechanical methods of reduction that we use, uh, how this affects particle size and shape. We're also going to uh, discuss properly feeding, crushes, proper defining material. So that, we can, that helps us uh, choose the proper equipment and properly defining uh, material also uh, affects our crusher selection. And then at the end, I'll briefly discuss crush the prop, some of the proper methods of feeding crushers and why the subject is important. Let's start with the basic question of what is crushing. We define crushing as the reduction in size of solid materials, and generally we limit to top sizes no smaller than an eighth to a quarter of an inch. What I mean by that is any, any reduction in sizes smaller than these sizes are referred to as milling or grinding, pulverizing, communication, and all these subjects would be uh, a good subject for another time. So we're going to concentrate today on reducing the size of material uh, sizes generally bigger than an eighth of an inch. Necessary to reduce the size of particles. There's many reasons. Uh, for example, you want to improve the efficiency of combustion, such as when we split wood before we put it in a fireplace, or when we crush coal before we put it in a furnace. We wish to improve the reactivity or the mixing uh, of material, like when we put grated sugar in coffee instead of large lumps or on food. Lone in a fluid bed boiler where we're creating more surface area and we're able to capture more sulfur and, and more reaction takes place. We have to improve the handling, make it easier to convey. Your, uh, to load. Uh, in this case, for example, we might crush coal before we put it in a rail car because we're going to be able to get a lot more coal in the rail car than if we put lumps in there. We wish to improve consistency of the material, such as the case with fertilizers or road salt. We don't want large lumps of fertilizer on the lawn. You'll be burning the lawn. Uh, and the same for rock salt when we're spreading it on roads. Or... We wish to beneficiate the material, such as when we're crushing coal so that we can separate uncrushables or ash from the coal, screening or washing, and the same with ores, where we want to crush the material and beneficiate or separate uh, material that are unwanted for base material. Once we crush a solid part, Particle. Well, when we crush a particle, a whole range of sizes is produced. And this is important because not always is this uh, taken into account. We can define, define these particle sizes in several ways. We can define them as fractions, a quarter of an inch, two inch. Uh, we can define them by mesh sizes. We have a four mesh size. Uh, you'll see them. Uh, referred to as micron sizes, more of a metric designation, used to describe the size of particles. A uh, slide that I put up here is one that shows some different examples of how we might define a material. We say it was plus four inch, where all the material was larger than four inch, or minus certain size, minus inch and a half in this case, meaning all the particles are smaller than inch and a half. We could we could find it more tightly by saying four inch by inch and a half, where all the particles are in between those two sizes. And often we'll hear terms like two by zero, where the saying there is that's the biggest size, two inch, all the way down to dust. 
or they refer to the top size where we're just referring to the low particle degradation. Uh, also, you'll also see some designations from time to time on round opening and square opening. And in certain cases, this designation is important. In others, it's not so important. But in, uh, in full sizing, for instance, the designation or the difference between a square opening and a round opening can be critical. You'll often hear the term fine. Fine. Fine really in the eye of the beholder. But what are fines to one customer may exactly what another customer is looking for. Generally, think of fines as material that is smaller than what your customer is looking for. So it's not really an absolute designation. It's more a qualitative designation. How do we define the size of a piece of, of material? Do we crush it? What we do is we'll take a representative sample. The entire sample could be used in some cases in mind. If the sample is small enough or the material large enough, we may use the entire sample. Material can be hand sorted in the basic case, and we that. It can be stacked into a pile. And sewn and quartered, we'll pull the material into into a pile and then split that into in the quarters. We use a mechanical splitter, which is all used. A splitter is a device that we can feed all the material in the top, and through the device inside splits it into quarters or eighths or half inch or half samples. Eventually, the sample is proportionally be proportionally split in volume so for the sieve sizes that we'll be using. The larger the sieve size, the larger the sample we can use. The smaller the sieve size, we'll cut that sample down into progressively smaller fractions so as to not to overload the sieves. Then materials put on the stack of sieves Agitated, the, the, uh, the material that's held on each sieve is weighed, graph is produced. Here is just one example, another example after this, of typical uh, presentation of the data, if you will, for screen analysis. In this case, the uh, right hand axis shows the percent passing each sieve size, or the, the cumulative to percent passing, and across the horizontal axis at the bottom are the sieve sizes. So, uh, you'll see in this graph that you go from about an inch on the far right-hand side down to 270 mesh, so it gets from coarser on the right to so far on the left of the, of the graph. And you can see it produces a whole range of sizes. This is uh, just one form of presentation. The paper that I show here in this view is what's called Oz and Rambler paper, and what yeah, and the uh, presentation that it shows is a straight line presentation. Uh, I'm also trying to describe in this slide is a lot of times uh, have two lines shown on the same graph. We're given a range. Uh, what the objective is here is to get the maximum amount of material and crushing in between the two lines here. In other words, the claw doesn't want anything larger or the right of this graph or smaller and to the left, trying to maximize the material that is is center. Common uh, for fluid bed boilers to see. F like this, where the boiler wants uh, not coarse material and not real fine material, but wants the maximum in this range. Okay, let's talk about uh, 
crushers in general and four methods of mechanical reduction that a crushers will employ. Uh, these are impact, attrition, and compression. We'll add each one individually and so how the crushers can use uh, these actions combined in a crusher. Some crushers use only one method to combine these uh, in the process. The impact. Impact is the most basic, and it's hitting a nail with a hammer, hitting a ball with a baseball bat, or throwing a material against a, a wall or solid surface. Impact is usually used on, on friable material. Friable material is defined as a, as a material that would break easily under impact. Okay. And also. Generally, these machines are, are, are employed mildly abrasive to abrasive material. Um, some of the characteristics of cream in impact are you get a fairly re large reduction ratio. Reduction ratio is the ratio of the input size going into the crusher to the output size reporting after crushing. Reduction ratio. Uh, pack crushers tend to have a relatively low horsepower per ton re requirement. Uh, also tend to have relatively lower rates of crusher wear than other types. And generally produce what we call a cubicle product, and this is because in the impact action of striking the material, it tends to break along natural fault lines that are in the material. The impact force uh, works in conjunction with the material and, and its uh, fault planes or its weak planes to break it. Uh, generally, uh, you get uh, minimum extreme fines, although you will get fine material breaking in impact. But uh, when, we, when we talk about the, some of the methods you'll see that we're not doing a lot of work with impact. It's strictly free impact. Examples of crushers that would use this free air impact, a couple of our crushers would be like a reversible impactor that you see on the left, where the material just comes in and struck by the hammers. The bottom of the machine is open. The material falls out. On the right-hand side, you see cage mill. In this case, the material comes down into the top, into the center of the machine, and then has to work its way out through the cages. These cages, think of them as squirrel cages, uh, counting squirrel cages, if you will, and the material's got its work its way out and out the bottom of this machine. Keeping that in both of these cases, there isn't any internal classification, so to speak, inside the machine. It's just strictly material struck by the crush elements and falls out the bottom. The second method we want to talk about is what's called attrition. Attrition is grinding of material between two surfaces. Typically, we'll use attrition on materials that are not overly abrasive and relatively free flowing. This type of reduction does give somewhat of a large reduction ratio also, but the horsepower per ton is higher than that with an impact crusher. More work is being done in grinding the material between the two surfaces. In conjunction with that work being done, you're going to see higher rates of wear with an attrition type mill than you will with the impact mill, although this work depends on how abrasive the material is. You're going to create more fines in a machine like this, uh, and that's a function of the, the grinding action of the elements. Here's an example of a machine that kind of combines the impact that I talked about in the upper section. The hammers hit the material when it first comes in the machine, and there's some grinding or attrition. The material works its way down to the machine. 
There's a shim between the hammerheads and the cage. Uh, the material is swept down over the, the bars in the cage. The third is shear. shear. Think of shear as the action of scissors on material, where you're cleaving the material between two surfaces. Shear on all types of materials, and really the reduction ratio that we get out of a machine like this depends on the material characteristics. Again, if the material is friable, you may get a larger reduction ratio. Shear tends to uh, keep fines yeah, to a minimum, however. And shoes where we're trying to minimize fines. An example of a machine that employs shear would be sizer. Here, a picture of a uh, Mountaineer sizer where you have two rolls counter rotating and the material is crushed between the rolls. All similar to, somewhat similar to a, a compression crusher that I'll talk about next, the roll crusher, similar action. But material is sheared between the counter rotating teeth on this, on the sheet. Last method is what we call compression. There's a squeezing of material between two surfaces. Compression crushing, it's interesting. It's we use compression crushers on both very hard and abrasive materials and materials like say uh, limestone, granite, some glass, cullet. We also use compression crushers on materials that are not so hard where we, we want to minimize fines generation. This is where we see the roll crushers used a lot on softer materials like coal, like rock salt, like potash, things of that sort where you don't want to over crush the material. So interesting, we use compression crushers both on very hard materials because compression crushers don't create, a, uh, you don't have a high speed machine don't have a machine that's doing a lot of grinding, so that makes it ideal for a hard abrasive material. But because of those factors, they will create a lot of fines, and they make use they make sense to use on materials that aren't necessarily so hard, but are rather we're trying to minimize the generation of fines. Example of compression crushers would be our roll crushers on the left and our dull crushers on the right where the material in both cases is kind of squeezed between the crushing surfaces. One of, one of the things to keep in mind about compression crushers is tend to have the most limited reduction ratio of all the types that I just talked about. That's because uh, the material needs to be small enough to be able to be grabbed either between the rolls in a roll crusher or between the jaw plates in a jaw crusher be efficiently. If the material is too large, the material won't be grabbed effectively and it tends to bob above the crushing surfaces. And uh, generally, compression crushers are limited to four, six to one reduction, depending on how soft the material is. Uh, this relationship between the size of the feed going into the crusher and uh, the ability of the crusher to grab it is what you'll hear us on times referred to as the nip angle. Uh, the nip angle is something we could probably talk about in detail uh, if we have time. But that you'll hear that term nip angle. And nip angle really a, 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 is comes in play when you're talking about compression crushers and their ability to grab the material in the top of the feed opening and process it efficiently. Reading the, the advantages or disadvantages of each crusher type is one of the things that we do here amongst ourselves when we get the crushers, the customer's requirements for what they're looking for. For instance, crushers have a high degree of attrition. Crushers that have a lot of grinding involved, they make relatively small product sizes, but we do not want to use them because they may on hard materials because you may get 
unacceptable rates of wear, or they generate too many fines for a particular application. Structures use a high degree of impact, for instance, may produce fewer fines and not have the wear of some other types of machines, but may not have the top size control that you want. Compressed crushers, like we say, they have relatively low rates of wear and, and low power requirements and produce fewer fines, but they may not be compatible if the material contains lots of fines or contains sticky material, as you wouldn't want to continually pack material between the crushing surfaces and a compression crusher. These things come into play when we're trying to select a crusher. And I kind of summarized some other items here that we take into account. All items uh, come to our selection uh, when we're selling on a machine. When we say low price, we're looking at the most economical machine up front, but better than that with the maintenance that somebody will do down the road. When we talk the smallest in size, what we're trying to do there is match the throughput of the mean, because if we go larger than necessary, you get in larger floor space, larger foundation requirements. Uh, the least power, power is something that the customer is going to pay for all the time. So you're trying to find the machine that crushes most efficiently with the least power required about describing the materials as we go forward. You'll see why the, uh, an accurate description of the material is important and plays into all these things. All we're looking for a machine that's easiest to maintain, has the most accessibility, least number of parts. Uh, all these things come into the cost of ownership down the road. So uh, we weigh all these things in conjunction with the the characteristics of the of the uh, material to be crushed, which we'll talk now. The other thing I like to do is when I'm talking to the customer, they're usually a wealth of information. They have existing equipment, or they've operated existing equipment in the past. They have their likes and dislikes. They can tell you what worked on their material, what didn't work on their material. Um, they have their own preferences for the type of machine they may like to work on, or or their their maintenance crew is more uh, efficient at working on certain types of equipment or more comfortable. Uh, and the more opinions you can kind of get about uh, existing equipment or past experience also helps to, to uh, tailor might be a, a more attractive offering for, for the customer. Okay, uh, let's talk about the screening material. How to describe feed materials. Uh, description, start with that, is the, material, the size of the material, the shape of the material. Is it slabby? Is it round? Is it regular in shape? How a piece of visit? What are the content? What's the most hardness? You'll ask those questions. Most hardness is a relative index of material hardnesses from, say, diamond at a 10 down to something that's soft like a rock saw. Uh, you'll hear us ask about hard grove grindability when we're talking about coal. Hard grove grindability is also, a, you'll hear about bonds work index when you're talking about limestone. These are all ways to describe the abrasiveness or hardness of a material. Friability. Friability is, is a relative term, but it's really how easily is the material fractured? Does it break very easily just under impact or, or squeezing it or dropping it? Friability. Is the material wet or sticky? As I previously, if the material is wet, you're going to probably steer away from compression type machines or machines that have internal classification that can plug up. There may be times when you need a machine like that to attain product sizing, but sticky materials generally will 
try to keep to a more open machine and uh, maybe use two stages of crushing. Uh, what's the temperature of the material? Is it the ambient temperature? Is it going to be elevated in temperature? Are going to be in a, in a situation where the characteristics of the material change significantly when temperature changes? Uh, we have machines that operate in environments where the temperature may swing 120 degrees over the course of a year, and the materials can change in characteristics over period in the same way. Is it manufactured material or is it natural material? Natural materials, man-made, uh, natural materials tend to have their own fault lines, their own stress points. They're not regular in shape when you crush them. You can concentrate the crushing forces because of the odd shape of the material. Whereas a manufactured or a man-made material, take a brick, for instance, uh, you're going to probably have to generate your own concentrations, and we do that by how we design the crusher uh, and some of the crusher components. So there's a difference whether the material is manufactured or a natural material. And then uh, all crucial is do we, how much extraneous material do we have that come in with the material that we're crushing and what made up of? Is it metal? Is it rope? Is it belting? All these things uh, can affect uh, our section of a crusher uh, and, and the type we might use. So we, we like to get a... Uh, description of any extraneous material. Some material you get rock in with the coal, not, not as uh, crucial a uh, uh, concern as if you get, get rar in with the material. So uh, the extraneous material is important to know. Uh, one of the, the thing that is crucial to sizing the crusher, and we get a discussion often with customers about this, is uh, feed size. You want to most you want to accurately describe the feed size most accurately describe the feed size for several reasons. Uh, if we state the feed size, we're going to have to size a uh, crusher that may be way oversized from a throughput standpoint. Just accept the in the large incoming feed. Size affects the hopper opening of the crusher. It, it affects the size of some of the crushing components inside. It can affect the diameter of the rolls or the size of the jaw crusher. Back to the angle of nip I was talking about. Uh, so you want to be accurate. Uh, you want to try to, if you have excessively large pieces of, a, of feed coming in, maybe grizzly those off. Maybe separate them and, and crush them separately or by hand uh, so that the majority of the material coming in is 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 more sensitive uh, of what the crusher is going to see. You want to be accurate in the feed size description. Is the material going to be what we call run of mine? Is, that is, is it going to contain material all the way down the fine? are going to be pre-screened, meaning that the fines are all taken out. This, this is very important uh, when we're on how large to make the crusher uh, and uh, where we're going to. One, one of the problems when a material is pre-screened is that, that all we to downsize the crusher because the screen will take out so much of the stream ahead of the crusher. This can be fraught with problems if the screen plugs, if the material changes, and material reports to the crusher than anyone thought. So when we when we hear about a pre-screen feed, we usually enter into some kind of discussion so all parties are aware uh, and oftentimes, it makes sense to just put a crusher in for the whole flow of material. And uh, that way, if the screen plugs, the crusher's still large enough, 
If the grid plugs, you still have a big enough crusher. And if the, and if the screen works efficiently, that's fine. There's just less load on the crusher. But oftentimes, it's, it's more of a problem, and the, the savings in the, in, the, in the size of the crusher don't want downsizing a machine behind a screen or behind some kind of classification. It usually makes more sense to put a full-size crusher in. But that's a discussion that's usually held when we're selecting a machine. Okay, talk about product sizing. Some of the things that, that we we'll questions about is 100% minus a certain size critical. Um, that that goal because what that may require in a lot of cases is that we're going to have to do some type of an external screening after the crusher. If everything needs to be a, minus a certain size, what's the product as the product is uh, desired? Do they, are they trying to avoid slabs? If they don't want a slabby product, that will lead us to different crushers than if slabs are okay. Uh, the cubicle product. Are fine desirable. Uh, maybe the application doesn't matter whether fines are included, but a lot of times the customer has a restriction on the fines. To do classification off the crushers. Can we do closed circuiting? Uh, here's a here's a uh, what I mean by closed circuiting, where we couple the crusher with screen and do our classification off the crusher. Closed circuiting allows us to do is to put a crusher in that's not so power intensive, not so maintenance intensive, and we'll just recycle the oversized material back through the crusher for a second pass. This is also a way to minimize generation of fines, where we do a more gradual crushing of the material and, and take the material out uh before it goes back through the crusher. The screen, of course, in this situation, you could have the screen in front of the crusher. We show the screen after the crusher here. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a way to limit the extreme fines. It's also a way to make a tight product assigning spec. Uh, we may do uh, minimum rushing each time through the machine. Uh, we get into a discussion is on throughput, time per hour, pounds per hour. One of the things that it's important for us to know is what's the bulk density of the material because this affects the volume that the crusher needs to process. Crushers are both volumetric and power uh, related. We, we need to have the right amount of power, but we also have a crusher that's low enough from a volume standpoint to handle the throughput. Uh, we need to know if it's going to be intermittent operation. If it is, uh, sometimes it makes more sense to size a crusher to run four or five hours a day rather than try to do everything in one hour. Uh, trying to, to, to do your production in one hour may put you in a much larger crusher than you need to meet some of the other criteria. And, and again, as I mentioned just previously, the pre-screening discussion always comes into play when you're talking tons per hour. What is the actual rate that you're is going to see? Okay, just a little bit briefly here at the end about feeding crushers because, frankly, one, this tends to be or can be the single biggest problem or the single most expensive thing to look when you're putting in crushers. Uh, properly, having them properly fed. Or when we're properly feeding a crusher is we want to have a steady rate. We're trying to minimize large loads, uh, insistent feed rates. And by small variations, we're talking about down to 5%. Uh, you have huge swings in the material that's being fed to a crusher, you're going to have high vibration, you're going to have high wear rates, you're going to have inconsistent product sizing. Uh, so what we want to do besides uh, 
constant or steady rate is also to have the material enter the crusher in a manner which uses the entire crusher, all of the wearing elements. Generally, to accomplish this, some type of a feeder ought to be used. Uh, you can then, if we have a crusher that's, say, five feet, seven wide, we're trying to feed that with a 30-inch belt. The material is not going to spread over that entire seven feet or five feet width. And we're going to be asking a crusher that was sized to be four inches wide to do the same capacity in 30 inches of its width. You're, it's just not a work. So that's the throughput on the machine. But at the same time, if you're not spreading the material over the entire crusher width, you're going to concentrate the wear the materials coming in. Concentrating the wear is going to make a tank product size difficult over the life of the wearing components. It's going to make adjustment of crush to compensate wear next to impossible. So what you're trying, what you want to try to do is make sure the crusher is fed over its entire width. In small crushers where maybe the ma machine's only two feet wide or 30 inches wide, not as critical. But we make crushers that are up to 10 feet wide, and it feeding properly in a 10 foot wide crusher becomes really crucial. And keep in mind that for the life of the crusher, you're going to throw away parts that were not worn forever. Uh, and you're, you're not going to make an efficient output sizing. If that's crucial to your process downstream, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really affect the big buck uh, items. So just examples of how you could feed a crusher. You have vibrating feeders. You have belt feeders. You have posimetric feeders. There are lots of different ways to feed a crusher depending, depending on your budget. Depending on why the machine is, some feeders are more suitable for machines that aren't so wide. As you get wider, you start to narrow the machines that uh, are are effective. Uh, things to keep in mind, trying to me just now. One of the things to keep in mind is you have to feed the feeder properly, and this is probably the thing that keeps most folks from putting in a feeder. You have to have some type of a surge bin or some type of a hopper above the feeder to make sure the feeder gets fed properly and has a chance to spread the material over the, its width before it goes into the crusher. Uh, oftentimes, we'll see feeders ahead of a crusher. The feeder is fed just by a belt dumping onto that feeder, and the feeder never has a chance to build up a surge and spread material over its width so that it can deliver material in an in a organized fashion and an efficient manner to the crusher. So yeah, the point he makes is good, a surge bin, and see, a surge bin takes up headroom. So now we have a surge bin, we have a feeder, and we have a crusher. And uh, need to be thought about and planned up front because it goes into the building layout, the crusher layout, and a very hard to retrofit. Once a crusher is put in with no feeder and no surge bin, it's difficult to retrofit down the road. Um, you're on. Uh, one of the things just uh, do make some crushers that where it's not as cool. Uh, some of our crushers actually like to choke fed. That would be all crushers, cone crushers, gyro where they actually like a head of material where the material has to work its way down through a crusher like that. And in those cases, having that feeder and all that is not as crucial as in width. It's still kind of crucial to you know, keep the material, keep the crusher full of material, but uh, not as crucial in that case. That's... Um, that's a brief um, crushing 101, if you will, just a brief summary of some of the things that thus in applications 
one of the reasons why we ask so many questions when, when someone comes to us with an application. It seems, boy, these guys have so many questions. Why need to know all these things? And and this was just kind of a brief summary of why we we mean like we have so many uh, crusher uh, crusher questions, so many application questions when you come to us. Uh, each each things affects how we what we pick a crusher size. Uh, I got time for some questions. I don't, I don't know how we're going to do the question and answer thing, folks. Oh, we prefer if you would submit your questions through the chat function or the Q&A on your screen, but we don't have any at the moment, so any questions you can also just yell out. Hey, Jack, I have a question. Uh, this, this is kind of a, a singular question for a sizer, for example. Uh, what's the maximum material crushability we can use in a sizer? Well, it, the sizer, you you can probably do up to maybe 25,000, 30,000, maybe 25,000 PSI. Okay, okay. wrong. I thought it was about 50. No, I... no. Nah, nah, 50, you're probably looking at stuff that's you're going to want to go somewhere like a jaw or maybe a, 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 a gyratory in those cases. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see anything. Yeah, what's any listed? Okay, we're testing now. Yeah, now the test comes. <laughs> okay. Got this here now. Oh, that's... Yeah, I think there's no more questions. If we have any more questions, folks, we'll what's the definition of top size? The top size. That would be the largest piece that the are going to have to handle. Attention. Now, that can, that can be described in many ways. You could have a cube. You could have a slab. you got to be careful. And that's one of the – that's like that first, that first uh, item on description. That's kind of what I meant. When you talk about top size, you can say, oh, well, yeah, it's uh, six inch, but I'm six inch by two feet. Uh, you need to have kind of an accurate description from that standpoint. With the feed material. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Output size, top size of the output can be defined many ways. As long as we know what it is, how, how it's going to be defined, then that will that will determine type of crusher we'll use to attain that output size. Okay. Now, a, a lot of times folks only need a 97 to 100 percent. They don't need everything to be 100 percent a certain size. However, there may be applications where that's crucial. But uh, most times getting with a couple of percent are going to be in the accuracy of the sampling of the system, uh, of the you know so so it doesn't become absolutely crucial. That's why you'll see often nominal a 97 to 100 and 95 because generally that's that's within the range of and the material oftentimes is going to be processed after after the crusher anyway. Back to the gene brand. Um, you know if we submit what looks like in our mind an accurate amount of information, you guys having a lot of materials in the past, uh, for instance, labs, if you're submitting a request uh, for their oil, you'll probably come back and ask that question. Be sure about the slabs and that because of your parole right. Priority, right. right? And, 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 and keep, keep trying. I just did this the other day. We keep, you know, we, we try to keep a fair library. I know all the, the doc has an awesome library of, uh, and Jeffrey, probably even more tests than anybody. We keep an, an awesome library of past tests, and uh, Holly and I were just looking at something the other day, so that helped too. Well, I don't 
with the population of machines that we can draw on, most times we're able to get we're able to zero in. Now we may, you know, the testing may help us determine what we want to put inside the machine. How we want to configure the machine internally, but we can oftentimes zero in on a couple of different machines that we want to use. Questions? Is the test facility totally up and running all across all brands machines? It, it the, the 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 what I say the singular test system no is not up and running yet. We are still running tests at the individual sites. Anything out of here? Nor has Gunlocker. Jeffrey, but we're still doing them at individual sites. Uh, let's we'll keep you date on, on that. Okay. okay. Well, listen, thanks everybody for their time. I hope it was helpful, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you next.